Good afternoon, colleagues and guests. As chair of the board of directors of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities, it is more than an honor, as well as a personal pleasure, to present the Theodore M. Hesburgh Award for 2021 to a leader of character, integrity, and accomplishment. The Hesburgh Award, oldest and perhaps most revered of the association honors, has been bestowed annually for nearly 40 years, each time lifting up a colleague who has served for extended years and rendered generous, exceptional, and transformational service. Of importance in the selection of the honoree is consideration of the candidate's contributions to the broader arena of Catholic higher education, such that even if or when a candidate has served an entire career in a single institution, his or her influence is felt and acknowledged widely. As president emeritus of Lewis University, our honoree served longer than any president of any Lasallian Christian Brothers College or University in the United States. And like Father Hesburgh, for whom this award is named, this honoree completely transformed the institution he led. In the process, he served as a leader of high integrity and accomplishment, recognized and admired by his peers, by his religious congregation, by his colleagues, both nationwide and internationally, and of great significance by his students. Our honoree served at Lewis and among us and still serves with extraordinary competence, compassion, creativity, and commitment. In that impressive light, it is with joy and respect, and on behalf of the Board of Directors and our entire association, that I present the 2021 Theodore M. Hesburgh Award to Brother James Gaffney, FSC, Lasallian Christian brother, and our brother, friend, and colleague. So now let's see what folks here have to say about Brother James. I really see Brother James Gaffney as so deserving of the Theodore Hesburgh Outstanding Service Award because he spent nearly three decades leading an institution and he really made his stamp on LaSallean education. Brother James has made extensive contributions to Catholic and LaSallean education, whether that's through his service to ACCU, to the International Association of LaSallean Universities, the LaSallean region of North America, or the Midwest District of the Christian Brothers. I think a university in our LaSallean circles, university president, is one of the most difficult positions of all because of all the competing constituencies. But I think uh, his role as beginning, as most brothers do as high school teachers, put him in connection with young people. Later on, he taught at the university here before becoming president. And then he was provincial and served as a member of the board and then chair of the board. So he had a great connection with the university. He had a great connection with people and also understood the lives of students. Brother James has done a lot in his time as a leader at Lewis to help prepare the next generation of leaders in Catholic higher education. He's mentored dozens of administrators and Christian brothers, created a dynamic exchange partnership with Bethlehem University in the Holy Land, and he's provided scholarships to men and women religious so that they can come to Lewis and get an education and then go home and serve overseas at their institutions as teachers, as professors, as administrators. In 2013, he received the Pro Ecclesia et Pontifice Award from the Vatican. And this is the highest honor bestowed by the Pope to a member of the laity or, uh, or of a religious congregation. I believe Brother James Gaffney is one of the most consequential figures in the nearly 90-year history of Lewis University. Given his achievements in the transformation of the campus, academic excellence, mission integration, and the fostering of a student-centered culture. He has really fostered the LaSallean characteristics 
of the university and, and has pushed that so that the university itself, while there are fewer brothers, fewer religious on the staff, there's a sense of that this is a, not only a Catholic place but also a Lasallian place in the tradition of the Brothers of the Christian Schools. Brother James Gaffney left Lewis as a university uh, which was um, poised for continued growth. Um, it's a place that he transformed into a place of, of deep beauty. He focused on details, the focus on the flowers and the lights, and of course the buildings which many presidents are known for. And he really made it a place where when people drive up our driveway onto campus, they are so pleasantly surprised. He knew by growing Lewis from a dusty airfield at the end of a cornfield into a true campus of brick and mortar, he was not just giving them merely buildings, but also a place for young minds to develop into contributing members of today's society. His ability to move the university forward was based on many very well-developed leadership skills, but it was in a major part also effective because he was able to bring his religious identity into the role of president. It was no mistake that there was a major emphasis on students. The time he spent, the way that students were brought into every discussion, it was not by chance. It was because that came from his identity as a Christian brother. As a student, you could be sitting in a dining hall, you could be at your intramural game late into the evening, and you would look up and brother would be walking through the dining hall, stopping at tables, having genuine conversations with us as students. And it was late in the evening, but he was there. And I think from a leadership perspective to see the person who was in charge of the university so available was huge and very impactful. In the LaSallian tradition, it speaks to the young person or the student that he is touching their heart. He remembers who they are, that they're individual persons. They're not students, they're not numbers, they're not part of a big population, but he knows who you are and a little bit about you. And I, I think that really makes it very clear. And say our own founder himself, talked about knowing the students as a shepherd should know the sheep. There was a plan to construct a student center within the first couple years of my being here. It's really important that it's named after Brother James because he was so student focused. Every student on this campus felt that Brother James knew them personally. To have it be the place where students gather to be together and to kind of expand their co-curricular life. Brother James' spirit is in that building and so it's really appropriate that it's named after him. As we look in time, he will be remembered as someone who spent time with people, particularly students, but with all people, who demonstrated that everybody's life was important, that everyone had a worth to their own identity to the things that they cared about in this world. And I do believe that that relational experience about, I care who you are and I want to know more about you, particularly in the office of a president of a university of a certain size, particularly to make that relational experience so important, that's what will be remembered. Greetings all. Uh, I'm deeply appreciative for the great honor of being the 2021 recipient of the Theodore Hesburgh Award. Fun gratitude to Sister Andrea Lee, IHM, a longtime friend, ACCU board chair, of course, very distinguished higher education educator herself. Uh, to Father Dennis Hoschneider, ACCU president, a great friend over many years, outstanding Vincentian educator, especially during his remarkable years as president of DePaul in Chicago. 
Also, thank you to the highly dedicated and impressive ACCU board, including my fellow Lasallian, Dr. Brennan O'Donnell, president of Manhattan College in New York City, to Dr. Kurt Shackmuth and Professor John Kilpatrick for that splendid video, to the Lewis University educational community, administrative team past and present, and certainly Dr. David Livingston, president, to faculty and staff and trustees, wonderful Lasallian partners, and to my fellow De La Salle Christian brothers, always supportive, collaborative, and remarkably student-centered. And finally, to my marvelous family, constantly and lovingly affirming me uh, in my Lasallian ministry and identity. The significance of this Hesburgh Award is quite evident in the extraordinary quality and competence of past recipients. Women and men remarkable in their commitment to Catholic higher education and enriched by the particular charisms of their college or university. And for me, the Lasallian charism dating back to St. John Baptist de La Salle, patron of teachers, patron saint. Uh, he, his successors, all of our colleagues and the brothers transforming lives since 1680. All of those past honorees and all of us have been continually called empowered, inspired, dedicated, renewed, and gifted for our common mission and our shared commitment in faith and hope and in the struggle for greater justice. Always trusting in God's fidelity for Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And our mission in Catholic higher education, the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and ever onward. And so may you, presidents, uh, never in the words of the scripture, never grow tired of doing good for the, your students. And so I end, uh, because it is always the students, I end with a quotation from a mentor of mine, Brother John Johnston, longtime American superior general of the De La Salle Christian Brothers. And he wrote, the starting point of Lasallian education is the students. Our institution exists for no other reason than to respond to the needs of students. All of us are invited to have profound reverence for each student. Lasallian education, and indeed all of Catholic education, is always about students. Reverence and love for each student is the fundamental characteristic of Lasallian education. So yes, the students. So friends, thank you ever so much. Uh, thank you for the great honor and the privilege of receiving this award and being a colleague with you for so many years. God bless. Brother James, tomorrow, today's morning reading in the divine office began with these words of Moses, provide wise, discerning, and reputable persons for each of your tribes that I may appoint them as your leaders. And God said, what you have proposed is good. And so we think it is. Congratulations, Brother James, and thank you for your service, for your commitment, and for your good self. Now I invite Jerry Turcott, a moderator for our closing plenary, to welcome our distinguished plenary speaker. We're on clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sister Andrea, and congratulations, Brother Gaffney, for this well-deserved recognition. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our closing plenary. Uh, my name is Jerry Turcott, and I am the president of St. Mary's University uh, in Calgary, uh, Canada. I'm also uh, the uh, Canadian representative uh, on the board, representing the 22 universities who are part of the Association of Catholic Universities and Colleges of Canada. Uh, I will remind everyone that we'll be accepting questions through the chat function throughout our session, and I'll go through these during the Q&A period uh, following our talk. Uh, but uh, for now, my great honor is to introduce renowned scholar, author, and educator, uh, Dr. Arthur Levine. Dr. Levine is a distinguished scholar of higher education at New York University's Steinhardt Institute. As a scholar, author, and public speaker, Dr. Levine is a major presence in the field of higher education. Most recently, he served as president of the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation after a long term as president and professor of education at Teachers College, Columbia University. Prior to his tenure at Teachers College, he served as chair of the higher education program 
and Chair of the Institute for Educational Management at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Dr. Levine also served as President of Bradford College from 1982 to 1989. Uh, he has authored 12 books and published scores of articles in venues such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, and many more. Indeed, he's so prolific that he wrote another article just in the time it's taken me to introduce him. Uh, in this closing plenary, Dr. Levine will be speaking on the future of American higher education, which is also the topic of his latest book. And in particular, he'll be looking at how America's challenging demographics, changing economics, and the rise of technology are transforming colleges and universities. I think it's fair to say that even before COVID, uh, we were living through the most disruptive time since the Industrial Revolution. So this talk today is therefore truly timely. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Arthur Levine. Thank you for your kind words. And good afternoon to everyone. I'm really honored to be with you for a lot of reasons. First, I've known about the excellence of Catholic higher education since I was a kid. I grew up in the South Bronx in a blue collar neighborhood. Everyone who lived there was either Jewish or Catholic. Many of the parents like my dad dropped out of high school. So my parents were always, because they knew nothing about higher ed, asking everyone they met, what's the best college in America? Surprisingly, there was extraordinary agreement. About half of our neighbors said Notre Dame. Mrs. Lenahan told my mother it was the best college in the world, but I think she was more ecumenical than a lot of my neighbors because she also threw out the names of several other Catholic colleges. But she assured my mother I wasn't good enough to get into any of them. Second, and perhaps even more helpful than Mrs. Lenahan, was my education as a trustee and chair of the Academic Affairs Committee at DePaul. There I experienced the values, the challenges, and the tenacity of Catholic higher ed, as well as the challenges common to all private colleges and universities. Third, my field of study is higher education. Since a student did his dissertation with me on the history of Catholic higher ed since Vatican II, Catholic colleges and universities have been a continuing interest for me. Fourth, Catholic higher education as institutions have led the nation in innovation. Starting with A, we got competency-based education in Alberno, and it goes all the way to STEM at Xavier. I've studied both, but I gotta confess to you, I haven't studied and don't know the names of any Catholic institutions of higher education that begin with Y or Z. Catholic higher education has had presidents with vision and moral compass has guided the nation. You just gave an award in the name of one of them. Fifth, I promise we're nearing the end of my list. I've only got 38 more reasons I'm glad to be here. I deeply admire Dennis Holtschneider, his ability, his career, and his accomplishments. Finally, and most important reason I'm glad to be here is you. You've intrepidly faced the greatest crisis in higher education in more than a century. And you're the people going to build tomorrow. Look, if I still have any time left, I want to talk to you about the future of higher ed. In order to make Q&A possible, I'm only going to speak for a short time. But that may not be obvious. I would tell you this, the last set of course evaluations I got said if I had 20 minutes left to live, I would want to spend them in Arthur Levine's class. Because every minute with Arthur Levine feels like an hour. <laughs> and that standard, we got about two days together. 
Okay, here goes. Scott Van Pelt and I just completed a book on the future of higher education. It's not a work of advocacy. It's not what the authors want. Not what we hope higher education will become. It's a, port, it's a report on the findings of a research study utilizing a tripartite methodology, historical, trend, and comparative analysis. Okay, let's start this talk by summarizing the trends, which focus on four forces with the capacity to shape the future of higher ed. The demographics sea change facing us, the rise of the knowledge economy, the revolution in digital technology, and globalization. I'm going to summarize them real quickly, sort of like cliff notes on trends. Much of what we found is already familiar to you. Demographically, Americans are moving, they're aging, they're changing color, and they're coming from abroad. The result is that the Northeast, Midwest, and Middle Atlantic states have declining college-age populations and no oversupply of colleges and universities. And the West and South have burdened college-age populations an insufficient amount of higher education. In terms of race, whites will soon be minority in America, and they already are in a number of states and cities. What we're also seeing is that the fastest growing populations in the country are currently the least likely to attend college or be able to afford higher education. In terms of aging, what we're gonna witness there's gonna be a generational competition for resources to support the largest domestic items in the federal and state budgets. Education and child welfare for the young versus social security and health benefits for seniors. The consequence of the nation shift from an industrial to a knowledge economy is the job market's been transformed. Industrial jobs have vanished. They've been replaced by knowledge economy successors. Probably most important to us. What it's produced is a combination of continually shrinking half-life of knowledge. Add to that COVID job losses and automation. And we can expect the expansion, perhaps even a new majority in higher education of students seeking short, non-degree, just-in-time, upskilling and reskilling. The revolution in digital technology, that really promises to bring the biggest changes. And the COVID pandemic accelerated all of those changes. Every college in the nation, as you well know, went online about a day and a half. While much of mainstream higher education has experienced enrollment declines this year, non-traditional online providers had really significant enrollment bumps. None of this is surprised to you. So let's go forward. What I'd like to do is ask, hey, what might come next? And I want to tell you about another part of our study, which looked at three knowledge organizations, film, movies, and newspapers. They're facing exactly the same challenges, demographic, economic, technological, and global. And what's important though, is that they've been forced to change more quickly than colleges. And the reason for that is that those of us who are in higher ed, our institutions change through a slower process of reform, piecemeal and iterative change, while the for-profits change by replacement. When organizations become outdated or unprofitable, 
new organizations spring up to take their place. So here's a shocker to Scott and I, and maybe it shouldn't have been. The three industries were fundamentally the same. It was like we were reading stories by the same B novelist. They all had the same plot. So let me tell you the storyline. So three industries came of age during the Industrial Revolution. New industrial technologies made them possible. Phonographs, motion pictures, cameras, projectors, electric printing presses. New organizations came into being. Film studios, music labels, newspaper corporations. And their job was to produce and distribute bundled products, records, movies, and newspapers. These new industries established consumer bases. They established revenue, production, and distribution models. And as you well know, as you well know, with hiccups, this worked pretty well for much of the 20th century. One of the hiccups was new technologies, television, radio. Another was anti-monopoly litigation and regulation by government. A third was consumer tastes that were changing. Turned out they wanted talkies rather than silent films. Turned out they wanted rock and roll more than Frank Sinatra. It turned, on, turned out they wanted in-house viewing in VCRs rather than going to movie theaters or only movie theaters. So all three industries were able to adapt to the changes that came their way. And the business models they created early in the 20th century remained intact until the 21st century. Then came the digital revolution and it disrupted all three industries. And we all know the end result. Streaming services now dominate film and music industries. And they not only engage in distribution of content, but it's production. In the newspaper industry, much of the advertising has moved to better targeted, more effective, and cheaper social media. The number of sources of news content have multiplied. So um, we know where this is going. We know the future of all three industries is digital, that the business models they had are dying. And that was inevitable. The question is, and let's begin here. How come these industries that weathered other social changes were disrupted? And there were eight reasons. First, these industries failed to recognize what business they were in. They weren't in the record, film, or newspaper business. They were in music, movies, and news. All three industries clung tenaciously to their industrial models and products, albums, films, and newspapers until the models broke. And then they held on to them further. Third, they used the same strategy to respond to environmental change whenever it occurred they sought to make the minimum changes in their business model necessary to accommodate in piecemeal fashion by means of repair, reform, and adaptation. They continued to do this even when their businesses were being disrupted and they were threatened with replacement. They were able to adapt successfully to changes in demography, to the economy, and to globalization, they were disrupted by technological change. The three industries flailed 
in the face of the technological changes. They threw a whole bunch of puny remedies at the wall. And when nothing stuck, they took the failure to be consumer approval of their historical practices. Sixth, they neglected the changing desires of consumers, the emergence of new competitors, and the advent of digital technology. The vision was claustrophobic. Uh, somebody has their sound on, and I can hear a dog. Their vision was claustrophobic, myopically focusing on the short run rather than investing in the future. And they expected tomorrow to be a repeat of yesterday. Finally, the re-envisioning of the three industries came from outside the industry, from organizations like Google, Facebook, BuzzFeed, Netflix, and Spotify. So um, let's get to the meat of this speech. What were the takeaways for higher education? The first is, we've got to monitor our competitors. New content producers and distributors are proliferating. They're entering the higher education marketplace as they did in the three industries. And they're driving up institutional competition and consumer choice and they're driving down prices. Look, you all know that there are new institutions that have been abandoned our traditional practices. They're emphasizing digital technologies. They're rejecting time and place-based education. They're creating new low-cost degrees. They're adopting competency or outcome-based education. They're focusing on growing populations of underrepresented students in traditional higher education. They're offering new certifications. They're also knowledge organizations, ranging from libraries and museums to media companies and software makers that are also entering post-secondary education. They're offering content, instruction, and certification. There are entrepreneurial firms attempting to impoach or attempting to poach our most profitable programs, high volume, low cost programs in areas like gen ed, business and education. And they're trying to offer cheaper, faster, better and more convenient versions of what we've done. I want to tell you about one example, in part because it was so shocking to me. I want to talk to you about Coursera. You all know the name, probably you know a lot about it. Coursera was a MOOC pioneer that was launched in 2012. By 2019, it was valued at something north of a billion dollars. Today, it offers 78 million users, 53 million before the pandemic, more than 4,000 courses in specialty studies, the range of across fields offered by traditional universities, as well as technical fields. Now, Coursera differs from traditional higher education in terms of who offers its content. And that's an eye-popping list of more than 200 of the world's leading universities and businesses. Its higher education partners are a veritable who's who of colleges and universities, such as Caltech, Columbia, Duke, Hebrew University, Johns Hopkins, Moscow State, Beijing University, Princeton University of Michigan, just to name a few. By the way, I wanted to know where the best universities offered their programs. Turns out Georgetown is using a rival, edX, where it has 25 courses, 
and Notre Dame has 57. Now, in the for-profit area, these are leaders in their fields. In technology, there are, pro there are programs, courses by Cisco, Google, IBM, Intel, and Microsoft. In finance, it's AXA, Goldman Sachs, Price Waterhouse, and in merchandise and sales, it's Alibaba, Amazon, Damien, L'Oreal, and Procter and & Gamble. And the not-for-profits are of equal renown. They include the American Museum of Natural History, the Museum of Modern Art, National Geographic, the World Bank, and the list goes on and on. To understand the real potential of these providers, you need to look at what they're actually offering. I want to tell you about two programs. The first is Google's Information Technology Certificates Program. It's a five course sequence. Students rate the courses 4.7 or higher on a five point scale. It's a field commonly offered by two and four year colleges. On average, it's worth 12 college credits and it awards a Google badge, which aligns with professional standards and testing. More than 147,000 students are enrolled in the program, which Google advises can be completed in six months or less with five hours to study a week at a cost of $49 per month. The first month is free and student fake commitment only a month at a time. During the pandemic, Google created two new certificate programs, which is showing up at a lot of our universities, data analytics and program management. The second course, which is being offered by the Museum of Modern Art, is entitled In the Studio, Post-War Abstract Painting. It's one of nine MoMA classes offered through Coursera. It's 27 hours in length and priced at Coursera's $49 per month subscription fee. It's earned a 4.9 rating and currently enrolls 44,000 students. The course description reads like a modern arts course at just about any university, but 55% of the alumni who completed the surveys, attributed a tangible career benefit to the course. Now those two courses couldn't be more different. One's purely vocational and this, the other is straight up liberal arts. What they share in common, aside from being cheap, convenient and highly rated, though with unreported completion rates, is that they're being offered by non-higher education providers. The number of, and the range of what's being offered is staggering. Beyond the courses I described, beyond what uh, Coursera has on, uh, course, what, what um, Google has on the Coursera website, they're offering segregated of their own programs. On the not-for-profit side, the American Museum of Natural History has its own graduate school that offers a PhD in comparative biology. They're offering a master's degree in teaching and they're providing six weeks online courses in subjects such as the solar system, evolution, climate change, and water for $549 each with an extra fee for obtaining graduate credit. They also qualify professional development credit for teachers. So here's the story. In terms of Coursera, the big issue for us in higher education isn't just the explosion of content, but the world-class standing of Coursera providers, non-elite universities, may be a particular advantage in competing with industry giants. Students have the option of studying at and obtaining certification for Google, 
an international powerhouse or usually, usually more expensive local regional universities. They'll have the choice of studying at the American Museum of Natural History or MoMA or a nearby college. Another attribute is that these new providers are more agile than us. Coursera had courses on coronavirus and COVID on their website by March, 2020. They opened all their programs to colleges and universities and 2,600 of them were taken advantage of by higher ed. Now it's not at all clear what choices students are gonna make between traditional and non-traditional providers. However, it is crystal clear that mainstream higher education is facing mounting competition for a mushrooming number of new content providers. And students have dramatically more choices, often at lower cost, in how, when, and where they learn. What's also true is we need to know our students. That's the second takeaway. The reality is that with the advent of the global digital knowledge economy and the multiplication of knowledge producers, the historic dominant unit by which we think of higher education, which is institutions, diminished in importance. So did control of the industry by those institutions. And here's the point. In music, film, and newspapers, the industrial era was about organizations and institutions, the producers and production of content. In contrast, the knowledge age focused on use of that content, the consumers and consumption of content. The consumer became the dominant force in the industry and institutional control declined. We've got to monitor the extent to which that's happening in higher education. Third, we need to create the future rather than attempting to restore the past. While campuses were closed in the spring of 2020, Scott and I spoke with campus presidents, the heads of higher education associations, policymakers and have credited about COVID-19 and their post-pandemic plans. Most viewed the pandemic in the same fashion they might a natural disaster, a flood, a tornado, a hurricane. They wanted to get back to business as soon as possible, clean up the damage and restore what had been lost. In this sense, most misunderstood the nature of the pandemic. They viewed it as an interruption doing business as usual, rather than an accelerator of the changes to come. They expect to turn back the clock to 2019 prior to the pandemic and recreate their post-COVID colleges. They wanted to recapture the past, which isn't any more possible than it would have been to resurrect the jobs lost during the Great Recession that required a high school diploma or less. The fact is that we paid a high price for this knowledge. We've learned that institutions have an opportunity as they plan to reopen to ask, not simply how they restore what existed prior to COVID, but to ask what they want and need to become, to look forward rather than backward. And that's gonna require us to face five forces. One is magical thinking, the belief that the challenges facing institutions are gonna vanish or fail to materialize. Another is complacency. 
and the assumption of institutional exceptionalism, which holds each college to be special. Third is short-term rather than long-term vision. We have a lot of five-year plans where most of us think only in terms of what's gonna happen next year. Fourth is making the same mistake that the three industries made. Attempting to view innovations that don't work as affirmation of practice. And the third is the real divisions between administrators, faculty, and trustees on campuses that make making significant changes and looking to the future more difficult. But each of our futures depends upon overcoming these barriers. The fact is we need to educate our communities about the challenges and opportunities ahead. One thing the pandemic did is provide leaders with an opportunity to do that. Fourth, we gotta recognize that higher education is the education business, not the campus business, not the degree business, not the credit business. The question of what business we're in takes on a special urgency in times of profound change. When existing institutions are negotiating a shifting terrain in which new competitors, new products, new methods of distribution, and new consumers are emerging. And asking what business we're in, we can't equate current practice with our business. It's essential to recognize that traditional methods of distribution may be liabilities. Traditional products may be outdated and consumer tastes may be changing. Individually, geographic groups or collectively, I've got three suggestions. Think about creating a skunk works that can look into how consumers are changing, that can look into how technologies are changing, that can look into who the new competitors are. Southern New Hampshire University, Western Governors University, and Arizona State University are doing that. They're skating to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. The fact is, another suggestion, Every college needs to reestablish connections with the street. You know, Jane Adams once said social work um, has one foot in the library and one foot in the street. So does higher education. And when the world changes quickly, we maintain the connection with the library, but we lose traction with the street. Career education and holding on to what's happening in the real world are essential. Third suggestion, make institutions distinctive. Everybody says that all the time, but it's really important. There are a lot of Catholic colleges. I have much more to say about this if you ask me questions about it. What makes your school special? Why go to your school? Why not go to another school? Well, as we look to the future, we are being presented with an extraordinary, extraordinary challenge, daunting and urgent. It's the greatest facing higher education in more than a century. But an even larger opportunity is ahead for us that's what we're being presented with. I'm not a Pollyanna. She was cuter. There are going to be closures. There are going to be consolidations. But there are also going to be enormous successes of historic importance in the future. We've been given an unprecedented opportunity to reshape higher education for the 21st century the chance to reimagine Catholic higher education for the future, the chance to win one for Mrs. Lenahan, 
I wish you enormous success because it's never been a more able group to take on these responsibilities. The future depends upon you and also because no one else can. Thank you all very, very much. I'm ready to take questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Levine, for your outstanding remarks. Uh, before we go to the chat, I thought I'd um, begin, maybe just because I'm into symmetry, with the same question that was asked at the very first question of this conference, at the very first plenary. Um, so it gives us a kind of circularity too. But I guess my question would be, because this is very sobering, your, your talk, and, and uh, arguably gloomy too, and, and a wake-up call. So I guess my question would be, given the challenges that you've outlined, what gives you most hope about the future of higher education in America, and especially as a potential engine that can help to heal, to educate, foster, and transform? I apologize if this talk seemed gloomy. <laughs> no, I really do, because I'm enormously optimistic about the future of higher education. And again, I said it's not because I'm Pollyanna. Leadership really matters now. Vision really matters now. And the nation really needs us. The nation needs us more than it's ever needed us. The fact of the matter is that in the global digital knowledge economy, higher education is a generator that propels the nation. Our research, our teaching, our service are essential. The resources exist to capitalize on what's facing us, not to let it pull us down. We have to be sober about what it is we're facing and we have to be alert and active in choosing how we want to respond to it. These could be the best times, not the easiest times, not the least daunting times, but they could be the best time for institutions and for the profession and for Catholic higher ed. Oh, thank you so much. I'm gonna to try to summarize some of the chats that, that overlap and, and uh, the notes I had here too. And but one of the comments is really that, you know, the, the facts that you're presenting are obviously indisputable about the change and so forth. but what we're also seeing, and I'm seeing in our own institution too, where you know we, we went online, as you say, with a day and a half's notice, and, and uh, everyone's doing a phenomenal job of suddenly doing this online um, delivery. But to a person, every single one of our students is missing the culture of the campus. It's missing the interaction, the, 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 even the social justice initiatives, uh, which I don't think Google is providing through their online platform. So, so could you comment a little bit about that piece and, and how it figures into the equation. Oh, I'm really glad you asked the question because as I was reaching the end of the speech, I was throwing out large parts of it. And that's one of the things I threw out. A few months ago, actually before the pandemic, the trustee of a college came to me and said, their enrollment was really declining. And what he told me was they'd been creating all kinds of new programs well, you know, lots of colleges are doing that, creating all kinds of programs. And the fact of the matter is they're all creating relatively the same kinds of programs. And when there's a niche program, regional universities, community colleges are tending to recreate those programs at cheaper prices. The question is, what can institutions do? The reason this institution was in trouble was because they chose the wrong strategy. They were saying the wrong thing to the people who they wanted to recruit. They were talking about their history. People don't come to a college today because they're interested in the prior history. What are you gonna do for me? Is really the question that matters. What do Catholic values translate into? What can you give me that other schools can? There are a lot of Catholic colleges and universities. Why should I attend yours? 
And the answer to that question is, what are you doing that's special? In the years ahead, we will see disruption, but it'll go primarily to regional universities and it'll go to community colleges, which are fundamentally the same and aren't providing the value added. Imagine a Catholic college that said, what we really care about is teaching. That's what we're gonna do. Matter of fact, every ad we put out says we're only gonna hire people who've won teaching awards. We have a center on campus that works with every professor who comes here. Teachers from around the country come to use the center and its resources. We write about teaching. We have programs in our various departments that focus on teaching. If what we can do is pick something that's unique, something that's special, that's in line with our mission and make that the focus of who we are, we can offer a different kind of hope and future for tomorrow. Mm, all very true. Um, I'm seeing a number and I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to try to smush. That's the technical term for it. Three. Uh, you academics. <laughs> <laughs> it's all jargon. <laughs> I'm going to try to combine three, um, three concepts that I think are, are circling around the, the thing. So one is, is asking if you have any specific success stories about Catholic higher education that you, you think really address some of the, the three key suggestions you're making and Embedded in there, a number of questions are saying, can you say more about Catholic higher education, how it distinguishes itself, or, or more about what, what we can signal? And I think you've touched on it on, on the teaching a little bit, but what, what can make Catholic higher education distinctive such that it will address these, these key changes? And again, what makes it distinctive is I really believe that Catholic colleges and universities bring a set of values that other institutions don't have. I learned that at DePaul in a way I'd never learned it before. And what I'd say is, make that explicit, make that concrete. Not in terms of abstractions, but in terms of concrete realities. Catholic colleges have been innovative and leaders since Cardinal Newman. And the simple reality is, I named two schools that differentiated themselves. Alverno's competency-based curriculum. It's not that Alverno doesn't have major challenges today, like all other small private colleges. It's that it's different. It's not that Xavier doesn't face the same problems. It's that Xavier is doing STEM. It's that it's preparing people for medical school, that it's doing health sciences. Those kinds of distinctions are what are going to make a difference. Thank you so much for this. I'm, I'm realizing that we are at the end of our time. Uh, which is unfortunate because there are so many questions. So I wonder if you'll be willing to uh, pick up some of these questions, if we can send them on to you to meditate on them in, the, in a, a future context. Um, but for now, I, I really want to thank you. Uh, absolutely not. No, please do that. <laughs> and what I'd say on top of that is the points I made, I said there are eight of these, three of those, 15 of that. My, my slides will be available. Oh, thank you. And can be sent to all of you if you want them. For no fee. You're even cheaper than... Oh, wait. There's no fee. Yeah, absolutely. No <laughs> fee. <laughs> uh, Dr. Levine, thank you so much for your, your inspiring and your generous talk. Uh, I know I speak on behalf of everyone. And uh, I do want to also thank the, the incredible team from ACCU that have made this conference possible. I think it's true to say this is, has been a conference unlike any that we've hosted in a time unlike any that we've lived through for generations. So uh, all this together is quite remarkable. So thank you, Dr. Levine, and uh, thank you all also who are listening for their contributions. Uh, it is now my pleasure to um, hand the virtual floor over to the uh, incredible and debonair president of ACCU, Father Dennis Hall Schneider. 
I thought Arthur gave me the nicest compliment today, but Devin Ayers, I think, takes the cake. So <laughs> thank you very much. And Arthur, thank you for all you do for all of us in higher education. You make us think and you push us in all the right ways. And that's been true for a long time. Thank you, my friend. It's mutual. Thank you. So, so now to all my colleagues who have for two days sat in whatever chair um, you found and listened to all these ideas fly by, I want to thank you uh, for all that you do every single day. Um, these have been days of immense challenges. Um, challenges that we knew, more challenges that have been said more clearly than we've ever heard. Um, they have been a chance to, uh, um, to think about the collective work we do, not just individually, but even if we don't see each other in hallways at a hotel, um, we've seen the names and we've we known each other is there. Um, and I want to thank you for all the work that you do, all the pivoting we started doing for the spring, um, all the ways that you've worked with your students, all the ways you work with your staff, the way that you've self-cared all through of this, and most of all, loved this enterprise that we call Catholic higher education. You continue the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ. You continue more than that. You continue his good heart for a world in need. And you put extraordinary intellectual um, enterprises at the service of the needs of a waiting world. Um, and if there are enormous challenges in front of us, there's also noble work. And I thank you for giving yourself to that work your whole lives, but especially this year. And I look forward to the ways that we'll connect again next year to, together um, in Washington, D.C. Those phrases next year in Jerusalem, well, next year in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm asked to remind you, please, that the exhibition hall is open, that you can meet with a number of our vendors. They're there, they're waiting, they're happy to speak with you. I'm also asked to, to tell you that the talks that you've been um, able to enjoy will be recorded or have been recorded and will be available beginning Monday on this site. So please keep your um, credentials that got you into the site because those same credentials will allow you to rewatch these or to perhaps see other ones that you missed because you had to choose in a given time slot. Um, and so uh, in where we, where we have them from the speakers, we will also make their slides available to you on the site. So please, after Monday, give folks a little weekend to uh, pull all this together, and we'll have all of that waiting for you. So again, thank you for all that you do for so many, and thank you for being part of this extraordinary association where together we try to care for each other and help each other forward for the magnificent work that we do. God bless you, and thank you. Thanks for joining us this year at our virtual annual meeting next year in 2022 we look forward to welcoming you back to washington dc into a new hotel the capitol hilton located blocks from the white house and now famously at the opening of black lives matter plaza the new facility will give us more room allowing additional sessions more informal meeting space larger spaces to gather socially and a convenient location right in the center of the city's life we look forward to seeing you there. Know that all of us at ACCU are deeply honored and proud to serve the work that you do every day at our nation's Catholic colleges and universities. Please call on us all throughout the year as a resource and a help at every turn. Thank you for the good work that you do, and God bless you.